Yeah, I think one was there was a um, uh, idolizing of unfettered markets. And much, if not most, of the intelligentsia were duped. I, rec I recall traveling with my dear brother Michael Harrington or talking with Brother Stanley Aronowitz years ago. And, you know, here we're engaged in critiques of unfettered markets, and it looked as if we were, we were medieval thinkers. Everybody was saying we're followers of Milton Friedman. Everybody was saying Frederick Hayek got it right. Everybody was saying marketize, commercialize, commodify. And we were still reading Lukash. And Lukash was saying commodification is not simply an asymmetric relation of power of bosses vis-a-vis -vis workers. So workers are being more and more marginalized. Profits are being produced. Wealth is being produced, hemorrhaged at the top. No fair distribution of that wealth or profit for workers. Poor are being demonized because they are viewed as those persons who are irresponsible, who will not work, who are always looking for welfare i.e. failures in the society of success. And we reached the brink and the chickens came home to roost. And a few years ago, the unfettered markets led us off and over the brink. And all of a sudden, very few intellectuals want to be honest and acknowledge the degree to which they were duped. Don't want to talk about the inequality that went along with it. Don't want to talk about the demonization of the poor that went along with it. Don't want to talk about the poli politics of fear that produced a Republican Party that was more and more lily white, using not just race, but also demonizing gay brothers and lesbian sisters, you see. Don't want to talk about the indifference toward the poor and greed being good and desirable and so forth. Now is a very different moment. And it's not, you know, just a matter of pointing fingers, but saying somebody's got to take responsibility for this. was a nearly 40-year run. Who paid the cost? As usually the case, you know, poor working people paid the cost, disproportionately black and brown and red, you see. So in the age of Obama, we say, okay, can we have a different kind of discussion? And that's what we're trying to do. But of course, you got two wars going on. You got still Wall Street in the driver's seat in the Obama administration when it comes to the economic team. You see. And you've got very, uh, you know, I think in some ways unimaginative uh, thinking when it comes to foreign policy. Be it the Middle East, or be it the European Union, or be it Latin America, you know, Colin Chavez, a dictator, the man's been elected. If he's, if, he's calling in the, if he's calling in the question rights and liberties, criticize him as a Democratic president. We did the same thing for Bush. Bush was calling in the question rights and liberties. We didn't call him a dictator. We said he's a Democratic elected president who's doing the wrong thing. Chavez ought to be criticized. He's not a dictator. The man's been elected. But it's that kind of demonizing that obscures and obfuscates the kinds of issues that are necessary because Chavez is also talking about poor people. Of course, I want libertarian and democratic sides. I want rights and liberties and empowerment of poor people. But talking about poor people is not a joke. It's crucial. It's part and parcel of the future of any serious democratic project. The fundamental question of any democracy is what is the relation between public in interest and the most vulnerable? That's the question. You see, that is the question. The test of your rule of law is going to be how are the most vulnerable being treated? It's not whether the torturers are getting off. We know the torturers don't have a rule of law applied to them. The wiretappers, they're getting off scot-free. What about Jamal with the crack bag? Take him to jail for seven years. Oh, so you got a different rule of law when it comes to Jamal on the corner versus your torturers and your wiretappers? Torturing is a crime against humanity. It's not just illegal. Wiretapping is illegal. You see. Now, it's not a crime against humanity because, I mean, you know, Sure, I've had my phone tapped for years. I don't think they commit the crime against humanity. Just ought to quit doing it, goddamn. I think to keep in mind, I mean, the demos is always um, uh, heterogeneous, diverse. Got a lot of xenophobic elements among the demos. A lot of ignorance. Uh, uh, a lot of parochialism. You also have a lot of cosmopolitanism, a lot of globalism, a lot of courage, moral courage. So the demos is not one thing, but when it comes to the ability of the demos to organize, mobilize, and bring power and pressure to bear, 
we certainly are in a crisis. Our system is broken. We got 71% of people who want universal health care, and you can barely get through a reform bill with a weak public option. It's clear lobbyists from the top, pharmaceutical companies, drug companies, have tremendous influence, much more than the demos from below, you see. So that, that those, those preferences don't get translated easily because our politicians are beholden to that big money and that big influence. Uh, um, but, I mean, the demos is still around, thank God. You got your own institution. Right? Dialogue. Dialogue is the lifeblood of a democracy. We've got to allow ideas to flow. You have to expose people to different visions, alternative arguments, and so on. They try to keep the torch of the progressive demos alive. But it's very difficult to, to organize it. Complacency is deep. Apathy is deep. Uh, uh, people are wondering how can you confront, you know, big finance, big government tied to big finance when all you've got is these little people who are willing to talk and so forth but have tremendous power bringing uh, serious pressure to bear. We can march, you know, we marched against the war by the millions. We were ignored by the Bush administration. Some of us went to jail. We were ignored. We couldn't translate into foreign policy. That happened sometimes. It was different in Vietnam.